Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we hope you enjoy the high tea. And to those of our um, guests here from the UK, we know it's traditionally served in the afternoon, but we just couldn't help ourselves. We hope you enjoyed. Um, I first want to thank Breaking Ground for hosting us here today at the Prince George Ballroom in this beautiful space. Um, this, this building is dear to my heart because as some of you may not know, this is actually one of the largest supportive housing residences in the country. So um, as people are having their weddings here and fancy events and think tanks having panels to talk about affordable housing, there's hundreds of um, formerly homeless people who make their homes upstairs right in the heart of the middle of New York City. My name is Jessica Katz, and I'm the Executive Director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. CHPC's mission since 1937 is to develop and advance practical public policies that support the housing stock of the city by better understanding New York's most pressing housing and neighborhood needs. Today we are doing research on how to make basement apartments safer and more habitable, how shared housing can help meet housing needs in New York City, and what charter reform measures can best balance local and citywide housing needs. We share knowledge about housing needs and policy solutions through innovative ways. In addition to the typical reports and statistics, we have created two award-winning video games, and we've even put on a museum exhibition that tells the story of how our housing stock is not nearly as diverse as we are. In the past few years, we have continued to put forth bold ideas and solutions to support the public housing stock of the city, and we hope to share a few of them with you today. In 2018, CHPC published New Partners in Public Housing, an evaluation of NYCHA's Triborough project um, that compared buildings involved with the Triborough public-private partnership with a control group of buildings that remained entirely in NYCHA ownership and management. Through data analysis and a tenant survey, we heard from hundreds of residents about their impressions of the transfer to public-private partnerships. The results were entirely unsurprising. When $80 million is spent to renovate a development, when tenants get new kitchens and new bathrooms and new systems, they are happier. It doesn't get simpler than that. This year, to help support new resources for NYCHA, CHPC worked on data analysis about a tax abatement that co-op and condo owners receive. Working in partnership with the New York Housing Conference and others, we shared data about how the tax abatement could be reformed and the savings used to help NYCHA residents. Bills have been introduced in the Senate and the Assembly, and negotiations are underway as we speak. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Irina Listovskaya, Product Director at The Collective, who generously supported our event this morning. We are so happy that The Collective are here to be our sponsor. The Collective are a co-housing provider based in London, now starting to develop in New York City. Irina? Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, and we're very excited um, to be supporting Citizen Housing um, and Planning Council with this event today. Um, the Collective has been working really hard to better understand and help address some of the critical global um, housing issues. Our mission is to build and activate spaces that foster human connection um, and enable people to live more fulfilled lives. My journey with the collective began six years ago, um, and since then we've moved uh, from delivering modest flat shares in North London um, to opening the world's largest co-housing building, also based in London, um, and now securing a development pipeline of over 7,000 um, units. Um, we initially started delivering our, developing our product um, as a direct response to housing um, issues with of, ha, sorry <laughs> issues with housing affordability availability um, and quality um, but now we're also looking to address um, the issue which is much closer to my heart which is loneliness um, which is where kind of our model for shared housing really comes from um, throughout our journey, we've invested heavily in really understanding the needs um, of our customers um, and are now working together with policymakers across the world to um, share this information and help um, impact policy. Um, I think we can say that in the UK now, progress is definitely being made, and this is mainly due to a collaboration between public and private sector. 
um, as well as an increased trust between providers and customers as we begin to explore new and innovative ways of tackling um, the problem of affordability. However, there is, as always, um, a lot more work to be done. Um, and I think more uh, partnerships between private and public sector would definitely help. Um, as well as, you know, us learning to trust um, each other, so that's public and private sector, and innovate together. Um, since our expansion to the US um, over the last year, we have been working really hard to translate some of our insights and operational experience to help meet housing needs here in the US, um, as well as work to help impact some of the public policy across the country. Um, I have been very fortunate to um, work cross, across geographies and can, um, from first-hand experience, say that actually looking at um, different models and cross-pollinating across different geographies is very important. And the event, like today's event, um, therefore is um, close to my heart and I think is a great step forward. Um, thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from the panel. Thank you, Irina, for your comments and your generous support of today's tea and finger sandwiches. Uh, so we're here today to learn about how public housing was transformed in the UK. Given the past work that we've done about public housing, CHPC wanted to contribute more, learn from who has been here before, and help policymakers find a positive way forward out of the stalemate we are currently in, because I think we all agree that something has got to change. There's no lack of finger pointing, but no big vision to move forward either. London is a good example for New Yorkers to learn from. They had even more public housing than we do, and it was in even worse condition. In 1980, there were more than 700,000 units of public housing compared to New York's 170,000. 30% of Londoners lived in public housing, and most of it failed to meet a decent home standard. But despite this, they found a way to move forward, and we hope to learn as much as we can today about the tools that made such a change possible. In the UK, there are multiple options. Some developments brought in new management. Some tenants exercised a right to buy. Public-private partnerships were formed either to renovate the projects, and in some cases, when necessary, entire developments were demolished in phases with tenants given the right to return, and entirely new neighborhoods were created out of once were super blocks of badly maintained public housing. These were radical transformations, and they were only possible because three conditions were met. Uh, First was a broad consensus was clear that something had to change and that government resources would be insufficient to solve the problem. The financial resources and expertise of the affordable housing industry was brought to bear, but it was balanced with the expertise and resources of the tenants themselves. So I think in New York, we find ourselves at the precipice of number one. For number two, we clearly have a robust, talented, and diverse affordable housing industry who's eager to help. For number three, the visits from the tenants that we've done this week with our visitors from London, it's so clear that we have an engaged and informed resident population at NYCHA, many of whom are here today. And if only we would provide a meaningful pathway for you to participate in decision making and not just discussion. Some of the, thank you. Some of the history you're healed today is very difficult to picture happening here in New York. Tenants crafting an RFP to select a new manager for their development, developers signing an MOU with tenants to agree to terms of a development agreement, tenants voting on a plan to demolish existing public housing and replace it with twice as many units, including market rate housing, that will pay for the new public housing to be created in its place. We're here today to learn from the people who were and still are a part of the public housing transformation in London, and our hope is that you walk away from this conversation knowing that change is possible in New York City. We're not pretending that everything is shiny and perfect in London, in London and England, far from it, but it's about pulling out some key concepts that we could learn from, from a place that has been wrestling with a similar issue, but more intensely for almost 40 years. Positive change is possible. That's the message we want you to hold on to. Bold new directions for public housing have been done in many places. Today you'll hear from an affordable housing owner and operator who will share about the different ways they have played a part in these improvements. 
We're also joined by a tenant organizer and a public housing resident who will each give us their insight on how they continue to ensure that the changes are responsive to resident needs. After we hear the presentations, we'll have some time for Q&A. So you all have index cards on your seats. So throughout the event, please hold up your index card and someone will come grab it from you. Throughout this week, our guests from the UK have met with City Hall, with NYCHA staff, a city council member, tenant groups, and toured several NYCHA buildings. Our hope for this event and our meetings throughout this week was to show that change is possible, that tenants can and should be the center of the decision-making process, and that by using a menu of different options and the resources and expertise of the affordable housing industry that is thriving here in New York, we can save our public housing stock. So let's get started. To start our event, Sarah Watson, Deputy Director at CHPC, who's been at CHPC for more than 10 years, but who is originally from London, where she worked on a regeneration project that we'll be talking about a lot today. Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. Am I good to go? Um, I've been here 10 years. I'm originally from the UK, so my they's and we's may be a bit mixed up through this presentation, so forgive me. And also, I'm a little winded with this baby, so I'm going to be slow. Um, okay, so I wanted to just give you a um, big picture con context for public housing in the UK and what really happened. I'm calling it the story of change. Um, in your program, we have a little glossary for you. So. Um, we didn't really want our guests to have to translate into New York words things, so it's kind of on you to do that translation, so you have a little glossary in there. There's, not, there's no exact translations, but because everything's different in different places, we acknowledge that. Um, but take a look at the glossary, and through my little framing presentation, I'll sort of pull out some of those, those key words that you'll, you'll hear from the panelists. Um, one of them is regeneration, that's how it was couched in the UK, regenerating public housing, and that's really, we're talking about some bold physical improvements for public housing and improvements of the ongoing management, and that was achieved in many different ways. So regeneration was like a catch-all for making sure that it was about improving conditions now and ongoing. Um, so basic context is the UK went crazy with public housing development. Um, we, for many reasons, we had sort of invented public housing as the first examples in the UK because we hit the problem of industrialized slums way earlier than anyone else. Um, we were also, as the inventors of capitalism, fearful about regulating the private sector, so decided that government was the one to do it. So were the first powers for local governments to clear slums, borrow from the national treasury, um, start doing some bond trading and, and build their own housing. Um, and then we had, through the 20th century, many wars. We had rationing, we had bombing. We had many sort of situations that lent itself to the government being the one to be the sole responder of housing issues. So it was really our only tool that we used for any housing crisis that came along um, and got us to this place where in the 80s, which was the peak, 1980 was the peak, um, in London, we had 770,000 public housing units. So because of that history, we have very diverse stock. Um, this was like the first public housing um, in the world, the Boundary Estate, which opened in 1900. Um, and you can see that through the 20th century, we picked up on public housing taking many different architectural styles, but that's why in the 80s it was an even more intense situation that we had such a diversity of different stock. Um, so we have stock in London that looks like this. We built like whole new little neighborhoods um, the government was responsible for. So we had houses. We had houses, more low density stock that looked like this. Um, and then through the 20th century got sort of more, fami more familiar forms than we're used to here, um, where we're going into replication of a architectural form um, and then really pushed that even further. <laughs> this is some in North London. Um, and then we carried on longer than here in the 60s and 70s too using new um, industrial methods of development. <laughs> Um, so this is some, house, some public housing in London and here. Um, so 
A big difference you can see in your glossary, you'll hear being referred to as council housing or local authority housing rather than public housing. Um, that's because London was broken up, is broken up into 33 different councils, which is like a council district. Just to make it easy, we call it many different things. Um, it could be called the borough, could be called the council, could be called the local authority. So you'll hear that maybe being talked about differently. Um, and it was the, the housing authority was much more connected to the local government than it is here, which is good in terms of political buy-in. So what happens to public housing is the voters, so you're kind of voting much more connected to the, the housing authority than it is here. Um, that can have other problems, um, but another advantage is actually that at least the 770 was divided into 33 different housing authorities that then could work out their own strategy forward. Um, overall, about a third of all households in London lived in public housing in 1980. Some of these boroughs, so you can see in the middle where the arrow's going, a, a, a council called Tower Hamlets, 86% of the households in the, in the 1980s lived in public housing. So we really had an intensive situation um, and hit a crisis in, the 80, in 1980 because the older stock that had been built in 1900 and had no ongoing, really ongoing maintenance and repairs was hitting bad conditions, but also the 70s stuff that we had built 10 years earlier <laughs> was also falling apart. So we had a public housing crisis that rings very similar to here. Um, declining conditions, the cost of operating was too high, the lack of subsidies, um, reduction in national subsidies to local governments, um, problematic management, disenfranchised tenants who didn't really have many options. And then it's sort of gone even more extensive than we have here, which is sort of the next step, which is that conditions are so bad, they aren't actually habitable. And we, we had a real problem with abandoned homes and boarded up homes that couldn't be filled even though we also had a housing crisis. There, um, there was bold leadership <laughs> to make the change, the story of change. Um, we're not replicating Margaret Thatcher, but I just wanted to say that bold leadership is needed for something so substantial as this. And we had maybe the, one of the boldest housing policy responses that has ever been seen, um, probably on a par of like the government starting to build in the first place. Um, and that is the first phase, the right to buy, which Thatcher invented. In effect, all public housing tenants were given the right to buy their home. The, 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 the response had been that we were in such a crisis point, something that big had to happen. This is Margaret Thatcher with a public housing family after they had bought their unit. So the major goals were a clarity around reduced operational burden on housing authorities. So it was really just get rid of the stock and it's almost like the most socialist version of privatization that you can have. We're gonna get rid of it and we're gonna give it to the people themselves. Um, and the most burdensome stock had the biggest discounts um, up to like 75%, 80% market discounts. Basically, if you could raise a mortgage, you could buy your, your unit. Um, there was maybe two or three years where you had to stay in it, but very little restrictions after that. So it actually became its own sort of market, home ownership market. You still hear today people saying, how did you buy in London? And they say, well, it was ex-council. Like it's still a sort of a form of housing, um, almost like the first rung on the ladder you could get to before you move into a different sort of home. And then allowing tenants to become owners. So this was a pretty substantial um, response. So we, in London, we, about 290,000 homes were sold to tenants. You can obviously imagine that having a big impact um, actually on the city as a whole and the social and economic fabric of the city really, really was affected by this. Um, but you have some real downsides too to a bold policy like this. And that is you're, you're left with the worst quality housing and the poorest people with the least options. And that's where we were in the 90s. So this is phase two really, which is a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, which is what do we do now? 
and the phase I'm calling it was a menu of options for how to regenerate this remaining housing that was really the worst conditions. And so talking about regeneration as we're talking about substantial rehab or redevelopment, demolition redevelopment plus improved management. And there was a real clarity around the goal for this phase and there, there has been ever since. And it was around this very English term, terminology of decent home. Uh, we must live in a decent home. The decent home standard gave a clarity for every public housing unit had to hit this in 10 years. That was the goal. So we're all in it together. We have to get every public housing unit remaining to get up to this standard. And again, the most English phrased, everything was reasonable. Um, but obviously this could be, and this could be the housing maintenance code in New York. Plus, the, the goal was elevating the, the role of tenants in the decision making to get there was a big goal because we were really left with tenants who had the least options in the worst quality housing. So this was the non-decent non is a nice terminology that we have in housing in the UK. Um, about 43% of all public housing stock was classified as non-decent in, in 2000 still. So this in effect was the strategy to try and get to decent homes as the goal. We had this big burdensome situation for housing authorities who were like adrift, had no operating subsidy, had this like terrible condition housing with the tenants with the least options, um, struggling. So the strategy really was, and we had the tenants struggling. We, had, we did have a very small affordable housing industry doing their own thing, not subsidized by government. Again, we've been reluctant in the UK to subsidize or regulate, like let private industry do its own thing. So this was a big change for the UK culturally. So there was a small amount, in London there was about 30,000 homes before this change being done by charities, effectively non-profit um, non affordable housing developers. So the strategy was similar to what's being discussed here. We, do, we have to bring in the affordable housing industry to come in and be partners and help the housing authority out. Um, they bring with them money because they could do private borrowing. They have more freedom. They brought with them development expertise and they brought with them management expertise because that's specifically what it is that they're doing. So this was really the major regeneration, overall regeneration strategy. But we were very fearful of privatizing public housing. We had so much of it because it was sort of part of a culture in the UK of the government doing it, si really since the 50s with rationing that the government is the one in control. So it was it was intimidating to bring in the private sector in this mission because it was all public land, public buildings. So to counteract this, this new partnership, we needed to add some balance. And that was about elevating the voice of residents to actually take part in the decision making about how to get to decent homes. So everyone was working together. And this was how the balance would be struck. So the tenants are, are are the public good, then they're speaking for the public good and trying to maintain any of the fears or difficulties of private sector getting involved in public housing to mitigate that. But also the idea, and this was sort of part of a political idea in the UK of the service user knowing best. Um, the idea that the residents actually know what is needed more than anyone else for their housing and for their neighborhoods. And so the private sector and the housing authorities should utilize that. So there was a menu of options set up for every housing authority to try and get to decent homes. And this is just some of them. You have some of these in your program. Um, transfer of a whole set of developments, sometimes an entire housing authority transferred to an affordable housing provider. And because that, that was concluded that that was the only way that they could get to decent homes. Standard. Sometimes there was pri more public-private partnerships. So the housing authority would partner with a private developer um, in order to try and get there. Sometimes it wasn't redevelopment needed, it was just improved management. So um, hundreds of thousands of units um, 
got transferred from housing authority management to what's, what was called an arm's length management organization. So a separate management organizations for a set of developments set up. And then the housing authority could be the strategic operator of that management company, set metrics for it, say where it's failing, say what it's not going well. Um, some of this went even further and actually it was groups of tenants that set up their own management organizations and then had, would have a contract with the public housing authority to be running certain parts of the management. So there was a whole array of different options set up, again with this goal of how are you going to get to the decent homes. This was a project I worked on in London, um, a big, we ended up doing it as transfer to an affordable housing provider. That was the decision made by the housing authority in direct partnership with the residents. The residents wanted full transfer um, for it not to be even owned by the housing authority anymore. And that was a, that's what the housing authority wanted and that they were too burdened. Um, so we worked with the residents to, to say exactly what all the new development would be. It was full demolition, full um, redevelopment. And this is the same site now, mixed, um, mixed income, mix of affordable and market. This is one of the units. So what we're going to hear from today from these three um, amazing panelists is a bit more of the story about how residents were really involved. This is not resident consultation. This is beyond consultation. So just an example of transfer, if the whole land and building is transferred from housing authority to um, an affordable housing provider. So this is a direct example from like the one that I worked on. The residents were um, selected the best regeneration option for them in part in direct partnership with the local authority, with the housing authority. So we'll hear some of the mechanisms for doing that, but certainly we'll hear from Jeff Bell, who is a public housing um, resident. Sometimes that's a direct memorandum of understanding or a partnership agreement between the residents and the housing authority that this is what their task is. And they have the right, right to veto the options. Um, so transfer was selected. The selection of the affordable housing provider itself, people, affordable housing providers bidding to take over and the residents pick with the, in partnership with the housing authority. Then decision making, <coughs> we'll hear from Jeff a lot more about what, this, what form this takes decision-making on the redevelopment, rehab, and the ongoing management plans for the development. And then there was a final vote um, on, the f on the final transfer, so that is all the development plans, all the ongoing management, all the ongoing community development, the lease arrangements, everything was set. Um, and then all the tenants in the, um, on the development had to vote, and you needed a majority um, to say yes. So the affordable housing providers, you know, we were really incentivized to be doing what it is that the residents wanted. And just if another example of just the management stuff, more on the tenant management side, um, obviously this is pretty direct resident involvement on the management side. But you could also have arm's length management organizations just where you, you choose to have three residents on the board or five residents on the board, like playing with those ratios of power to make sure that there's real traction for the resident voice. Um, I'm just gonna end and pass over to our guests. Um, but from 2000 to 2015, our non-decent public housing units went from 43% to we're around 16% public housing, um, non-decent. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Next, we have Kate Davies. Kate is the CEO of one of the leading affordable housing providers in London that can also be known as housing associations or social landlords. Notting Hill Genesis has been a huge player in rising up to partner with housing authorities to help regenerate their homes to meet what we will hear about is called a decent home standard. We will hear Kate's insight as a major affordable housing player, but also with a background working for housing authorities. So she has seen all sides of this housing issue. Kate. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's really great to be here. It's not my first visit to New York or not even my first visit to this amazing ballroom. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. 
And uh, I'm here with one of my tenants, Jeff. I'm his landlord, so it's really nice to be traveling together and uh, learning, learning from each other. But we do really come in a spirit of humility to learn from you as well. So please don't feel that we're here to sort of tell you what to do. We're just sharing our experiences. So that's my name and that's my organization, Notting Hill Genesis. We were formed in the Notting Hill area and the Paddington areas of London, which used to be very impoverished uh, areas of beaten down communities and beaten down housing. Now they're both very valuable and uh, fashionable areas. You may even have seen our film with Hugh Grant in it, yeah? We get a real sense of what it is now. Um, and uh, by improving those areas and owning a lot of homes in those areas about 5,000 homes in Paddington and 5,000 in Kensington. We've uh, enabled the people who live there with us for 50 years or so and their families to sort of come up and appreciate and, and get benefit from the improvement in those areas. Um, so this is our newly published uh, corporate strategy. It says our five uh, uh, areas of importance and uh, residences at the top and making sure that residents get the homes and the support that they need. Um, secondly, that we also provide new homes. That's very, very important. In London, there is a real shortage of housing for people with lower incomes, so that's a, a huge priority for us. The uh, looking after our homes, the quality of homes is very important, relating back to what Sarah was talking about, about decent homes. Uh, continually working on improving them is a key part of what we do, and we spend about £100 million a year on our housing stock. We have 65,000 homes. Um, also, I've mentioned our people, because working with our staff is it's as important as working with our tenants and residents, and financially being strong is the basis for making this happen. Um, we borrow a lot of money from the private sector, from the banks and the building societies and the pension funds, and we have to be financially robust to get money lent to us in, in vast amounts, billions of pounds has been invested in our organization and similar organizations to enable us to do this work. So um, what we're doing at the moment, the most important thing, as well as building homes, we manage homes, and then there is the regeneration, which I'll mainly talk about. But I just wanted to mention what we're doing around housing management, because the way that homes are managed is really important to people's quality of life. If you're going down to the housing office or you're on the phone every week trying to get repairs done, that can be very frustrating and annoying. So what we've really tried to do is look again at what's called housing management and maintenance and say, why are we doing this for people in this old-fashioned way? The model that we have in the UK was designed in the 1930s and we're still more or less doing it. So we decided to try to use digital. Now, as a company that's American called Amazon, and I know that you sometimes would get a hiss, even in England, when you say the name Amazon, and uh, the reason being perhaps they don't pay the tax that they should. But one thing that's really good about Amazon is you can get what you want when you need it, and it's delivered the next day. And that was our model for repairs and other services that tenants want, that they should be able to sort of order it now and get it within a very short period of time. And we've been able to use new technology to do this. We now have, and it's about to be launched very fully in our organization, it's been uh, piloted for a while. People will be able to order their repairs and the repair is described through the internet and a company that's able to do that job will bid for it, a private sector company usually, but it could be our own direct labor organization. We will choose the cheapest, they will come and usually do it within 24 hours. As soon as the tenant is happy with that, they indicate it on their phone and the money is released to pay the contractor. The small contractors are loving this because they are getting paid quickly. They're having all their receipting and all their business management done by the app. It's getting uh, very high degrees of satisfaction and it's a complete change from people badgering us for repairs. Now they organize their own repairs. The other thing is we are digitizing so people can pay their rents, can check their rent statements, and all aspects of getting services from us are going digital. This is combined with having local support for people. Our housing offices have a very small um, portfolio of properties to look after, uh, about 150 to 200, and with those tenants, they go into their home annually to meet the tenant, to find out about what they need, 
to check their home to make sure nothing untoward is happening, like um, illegal occupation or a subletting and so on, but also to check the quality is good and that people are not struggling. Sometimes they meet people who are unwell or mentally ill and they can get help to them. So this regular support, this personalized service is very important to go along with digital. We see digital as a way of personalizing services in a more effective way, not taking the human out. So modern methods of management have been very important for us. Just to talk about financial strength, because of course we all would love there to be you know, money growing on trees, but we know it doesn't. So strong financial management is, underpins everything that we do. And this very simply explains our model, that we make a profit from our market housing, that's our market rent housing and our homes for sale, and that creates that surplus, that large green lump of surplus. In addition to that, we borrow money, which we repay from our rental income, and we get grant. Today we get a really small amount of grant, just about 10% of the cost of new build comes in the form of grant. And that is what enables us to keep going, and this is a virtuous circle of cash flow. And if we have a, a strong and buoyant market, it's very much better for the business. At the moment, we are struggling in the UK with our difficult and depressed sales market. So we've been asked to specifically talk about regeneration, and that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, this is one of the schemes that we're involved in. It's called the Aylesbury Estate. It's the biggest regeneration in the whole of Europe. Jeff is going to speak about the regeneration of his estate in Hackney, but we have uh, three very large uh, redevelopments happening at the moment, but we have experience of doing about seven before now. And as Sarah briefly alluded to, I work for a local authority, one which did a stock transfer of its entire stock to housing associations, and another one that did a major regeneration in its own borough. So one of my lessons is that there's a lot of variety in this, the actual way that you do it will depend on local conditions, what the values of the property are, what the local tenants want, what the environment has, whether there's any heritage, what the nature is in the area, what needs are, and so on. So it's always a very specific answer. I don't think there is a for formula for doing this. But on the left is the picture of the Aylesbury Estate, built in the 1960s, now in very poor condition. And this is a computer-generated image we haven't yet built built it out because it has been very difficult to get uh, full access, full um, get the homes back, particularly from leaseholders because of the right to buy that we've had. Nevertheless, we are now demolishing some of the estate and beginning to build in the current year. <clears throat> and this is the day that we launched this scheme. The, uh, in the photograph, the leader of the council, you wouldn't necessarily know who they all are, you might be able to see me, but um, it includes some of my staff, the leader of the council, the head of housing, uh, local residents who are very involved and enthusiastic, and some of my community development staff. So uh, you can see behind that the estate looks pretty miserable and um, really is very difficult to renew. So that's why it's coming down piece by piece. And the whole scheme is a 26-year project. So it's unbelievably long to do this, but we have to do bit by bit. And as we knock down some, build it new, then people can see that the new homes are there for them and are very happy to move into them um, rather than just sort of demolish it, make it into a, uh, a wasteland and then build it up. We're having to do it gradually. The key lesson for me is that this is all about collaboration and partnership, people working together. It can't be done by any one group on its own. For us, the political leadership is so very important both national and local government have to believe that this is worth doing and they have the democratic mandate to make it happen. They don't often have the money, they do have planning powers, they do have a vision and political programs, so we take a lead from the political leadership. Secondly, of course, are the local residents. If they don't want it to happen, it won't happen. So they need to be fully engaged and enthusiastic about it. And the more involvement, the more power that is vested in the local residents, the better these schemes will be. Local politicians are local, developers are local, but the people who live there day in, day out know what works and what doesn't work. They know what they want, they know what will work. 
They know their friends and neighbors and, and the children's needs and the older people's needs, and they will lead these developments, and they need to be fully empowered to have an equal role at the table. And the developer, people like us, we have to have some skin in the game. We have to get something out of it. These are very expensive long-term schemes, but if we are not able to make some money out of it, we have no ability to participate. So there has to be what I would call win-win-win. You know, you could say in, in a number of negotiations, one person wins and one person loses, but that isn't going to work. Everyone has to have something out of this. All of us have different expertise. All of us have different things to bring to the party. So if we can work together, we can all bring something and all take something. And I think that's the key. If that works, then the scheme will work. And finally, I wanted to talk about trust. Trust is a very important thing. And if we trust each other, then we often allow people to sort of do things on our behalf. Jeff will tell you about how he has built trust with his whole tenant group so he can help uh, lead the development of that estate. You can't have thousands of tenants trying to micromanage a scheme. There has to be trust and delegation. And this, I think, is the most important thing we in public housing have to focus on, how we can get trust from people. My experience has simply been, firstly, that you have to get the services right, because if you're not reliable and you promise things that you can't deliver, whether that's a, a clean bin store or whether that's a transfer to new, new housing, if you don't deliver that well, you don't start to build trust. That's why we have that local offer of people getting to know their tenants so you can build trust. And you have to deliver again and again in order to, to build up that trust. So I said, you know, if you tell the truth to people, uh, even if it's not good news, even if it's, it's uh, difficult to achieve what people want or even if it's impossible, you need to tell them about the costs of things and what are, the, what are the options that you're weighing up, what you can do and what you can't do. If this truth is shared, and if the tenants and the politicians are honest as well, then we can build trust. And all knowing that we all want to get something out of it and that we're all willing to be accountable to each other seems to be the recipe for success. So I think that's all I wanted to say, and I'm very happy if you wish to ask some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Next, we are delighted to welcome Jeff Bell. Jeff is a public housing tenant, now an affordable housing tenant, following one of the biggest regeneration projects in Europe called Woodbury Down. Jeff has lived there for 30 years and plays a prominent role as a resident representative, making sure that the substantial development and management changes at Woodbury Down are in the resident's interest. Jeff has helped to shape the master plan for the project and has regular meetings with elected officials to make sure his voice is being reflected in the partnership work being done on the site between private developers, Notting Hill Genesis, and a community development organization. Please welcome Jeff. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, CHPC for asking me to speak. Uh, at, this, uh, at this morning's conference. We've had a great couple of days in New York seeing various housing associations meeting, meeting uh, 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 tenants, representatives, and it's been a real educational uh, lesson for us and to sort of do this. So as uh, Jessica says, I have lived in uh, Woodbury Down Estate for uh, 30, 35 years now. I came from Ireland in the sort of first place, and I was given a flat in would be down when basically nobody wanted to live in that area. Um, you will see uh, from the uh, slide we have that this is would be down as it is today, um, with the old houses in the front and the new skyscraping tower being built uh, in the back. And we have thrown in a nice little rainbow there. Which, which, which is actually real. I didn't sort of fill it in by any of Photoshop it in or anything. It was actually there, and hopefully that it, it, it sort of represents what we aspire to do. Um, there's 10,000 people who live in, uh, in the area, on the estate, and our experience has been to try and give those 10,000 people a voice in the regeneration that is taking place. But it's a bit more than a voice because as you see, I have um, given the title of my presentation this morning, 
the importance of giving power to the local people. And that essentially is what the story I'm uh, trying to tell uh, today is about, how we empowered our community to have a voice, to have a controlling voice at times in the way our estate was refurbished, regenerated, and rebuilt. First of all, I want to give a little bit of context to it. The photograph at the top you'll see is before the first regeneration, because we've had two. The, um, this was in about early 20th century, and you'll see, you can sort of tell from that, it wasn't actually a hive of activity at that stage. But anyway, after the um, Second World War, the area, the new Woodbury Down estate was, was uh, built. And um, this was built basically to house people who had been bombed out in the Second World War. Uh, and they came from mainly working class homes. And indeed, the people who lived in that area at the time said, we don't want these people coming here because these are slum dwellers. And so there was a sort of campaign among the rich and the powerful to try and stop the slum dwellers coming. But the slum dwellers came. Um, and the various fact that, 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 that they had survived bombing, or maybe they came back from serving in the Second World War, gave us a community, if you like, which was prepared to stand up and fight for its rights. And they came to an area as well, which, as you will see in the second photograph here, we have got, we had two reservoirs. Uh, so it just wasn't the inner city, inner city, city London dwelling, uh, the, eth the economic deprivation which sort of came to the area, but we also had our reservoirs, and our reservoirs were a source of great peace for us. We could walk sort of around them and so on and so on. And what has inspired the present story is that 35 years ago, uh, developers came along and the people who owned the reservoirs wanted to sell these reservoirs to be concreted over for the housing for the more prosperous people in London. Um, and the local people turned around and said, no, we don't want that, we want to save our reservoirs. And they fought a 10-year campaign against the national government and against the property developers to keep the reservoirs. And that campaign was a success. So that is a sort of lesson uh, from history, if you like, which has inspired us to what we do today. The um, regeneration, I'm just checking the right things come up on the screen. The regeneration deal then was that the 2,000 homes, and these were all council homes uh, at, the, at, at this time, the 2,000 homes would be replaced by 5,000 500 homes, um, and 40% um, of these two of the 5,500 homes would be affordable. Um, it was a mixed, pen, a mixed tenure development, which meant there was going to be private homes, there was going to be shared, shared, shared ownership homes, which means people can sort of buy into homes, but they don't pay the whole mortgage at this once. And there was the social homes, which were homes for rent, managed today by Notting Hill Genesis. So this was, to, this was a partnership development um, of the, uh, the local council, the developers, ourselves, and uh, Hackney Council. And it was regeneration, not refurbishment. That meant we were knocking down the whole estate and building new homes. And the reason for that was that the council didn't have money at the time to refurbish. But we were guaranteed from the very start the right of a return for all social uh, tenants in this estate. This is not something which happens in every regeneration scheme in the, uh, in the sort of UK, but that was a promise from the start, and that was what sort of made it sort of possible. We also have written into the whole regener regeneration deal a something called Section 106, which I think is in your brochure, which means that a certain percentage of the profit which the developers make have to be fed back into the community to help provide uh, schools and various other things like that. So that's sort of an important provision. So our aim was 
to make our voices heard. Um, we, this is the, uh, this is, the top picture here shows uh, our new shop, and our new shop was provided by the developers, and the rent is paid by Hackney Council. Um, and that was open four or five years ago. And that's, if you like, it's a sort of symbol of, 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 the, of the partnership which we, which we were uh, trying to sort of build. But the early, st the early story, the early story of the development which actually took place was rather more one of consultation than empowerment. Um, and a lot of mistakes were made in the first phase of rebuilding the estate. A lot of promises, well, some promises, which had been made by the various partners weren't actually kept. So we said when, a, when the next phase was p p p p proposed that we needed, we took the opportunity to try and press for a change of practice and said, henceforth, and we said we would oppose the, uh, the, the various plans which were at that stage being put forward um, to carry on the regeneration and we would oppose those, those plans if we didn't come to some form of agreement. So eventually a memorandum of agreement was formed between ourselves and uh, the developers which meant that we would have a seat at the planning of the uh, estate in the future for the next phases. And not only would we have a seat, but we wrote into the memorandum of agreement that we would have the right to veto anything we didn't like. Um, and so that gave us a real powerful voice, and if you like, that is, that is something we have made use of ever since then. We um, managed to carry this thing through by various processes such as the round table which, which, uh, which, which, which we meet with the Mayor of Hackney every two months in which all the partners sit around the table and discuss what is sort of going on and discuss the way sort of forward. So again, it's being there at the sort of seat of power, at the seat of authority. Our principle, which we wrote into the memorandum of agreement at the start was to have a balanced and mixed community. And that meant that we didn't want any, we didn't want the, sort of the rich people in one section of the state and the poor people in a, another section of the estate. We wanted them to the mix and we wanted, and, 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 and we wanted the various uh, tenures to come together and build the community together. So that means our sort of organization just doesn't rep represent the social tenants, it also represents the shared ownership tenants, it represents the sort of private tenants whose representatives all sit on our board. What are our aims? Our aims at this present stage are first of all to make sure that the affordable homes remain affordable. We've got things like, you know, we, do, we sort of do find sometimes that, um, especially in the shared ownership homes, that, the, uh, that while the, sort of the mortgage level stays the same, service charges go up and up. So at the, the sort of recent sort of controversy, if you like, we've had is to try to look at those service charges and, 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 and we have now been promised a, uh, a charter from the developer to, to about how our service charges become affordable. So that's the sort of, sort of thing um, we want and we continue to negotiate. We have always said, and this again was something which was in our uh, memorandum of agreement that we should have pr proportionate views. What we mean by that is that in the first phase of the development, the, um, uh, the people, the sort of private, private development tended to get the better views of the reservoirs, while if you like the social homes were, over, were overlooking the main roads, which isn't, you know, the same. So, we tried to turn that round, and so we, again, we've got this written in a, a, an agreement that because 40% of the new homes would be owned by social homes, then we should have 40% of the best views. And again, that is something which has been um, signed up for. And, but the most important thing, I think, was that what we are building in, 
and our area is not simply new homes, we're, we're, we're rebuilding our community. That means we have a new community center, a new school, a new youth club. We have new shops coming in. And we have a say on, a, on sort of how all these things are actually sort of organized and who controls them and what sort of shops are sort of coming in, sort of so on and so on. We have gained from this a wonderful new nature reserve on one of our reservoirs, which was, which was recently opened by someone called David Attenborough, who some of you might know, a very famous television personality. And he came and, and opened our new nature reserve, which is a wonderful asset to, to, our, to our area and brings people in and obviously brings money in far and wide from people who's, who sort of come to, come to, come to uh, visit us. The picture in the sort of bottom there is, uh, is, 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 is our new school, and the picture at the top is the picture of some of the homes which are now being built. Sorry, um, where we are, the, the, the progress of regeneration at the moment as we have come We've uh, finished about one third of the uh, homes, um, so it's, 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 it is a long, it is a long project, and it'll be a last another another ten years at at least. But things at the moment are sort of running smoothly enough, really. How we work this sort of process, the major um, uh, way we now manage regeneration is through a design group. Uh, and, and this design group looks at things like and makes the decision on all aspects of the, new, of the new phases which are being built. That is where the blocks are going to go, who are going to live in them, what the exterior design of the blocks are going to be, and what the interior design of the social homes is, is, is sort of going to be. And that goes from where the sort of windows are placed or to where the electrical sockets are sort of placed, if you like. Everything which is to do with the interior design of the, of the, of the, of the new homes. We also determine through this uh, group um, what the landscape of the area is going to like, where the green spaces are sort of going to go, how are we going to fill those green spaces and, and uh, so on. At the end of each phase uh, of the development, we um, draw up a sort of document which the developers called learning the lessons, i.e. things which maybe haven't gone, gone right. You know, and we, we call uh, making mistakes. They, we, we call them learning mistakes, they call them learning lessons. But there, there you are, you know, I mean, these things, these things happen. So we draw them. And you see, the thing is, because we actually live in these homes which have just been built, any mistakes which sort of have been made, and they're not huge ones, you know, it's, it's, it's just things like, you know, like veranda doors shouldn't sort of open sort of outwards or the wind can sort of blow them, you know, and, and we turn around and tell the developers, this was a mistake. And they says, you know, these guys are right. And of course, we are right because we live, we, we have lived in these homes. We have lived in the homes that are being built. So we're able to sort of tell them this. So we're the experts and they don't even have to pay us, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful resource we sort of give them really here, you know? No, but not, not sort of everything has sort of gone right. Because I'm not, I don't want to build too rosy a sort of picture there. You will see the, um, the sort of picture in this is a, 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 um, a picture of a sort of swimming pool. And the sort of swimming pool was, um, is, is swimming pools are provided in a number of the new uh, blocks for uh, private, uh, private sort of owners. Now, we didn't really like that because we thought it went against building an integrated community. You know, so they had private gyms. There was also a cheap gym for the, sort of the ordinary people and things like that. So it's meant that people didn't, didn't, die, didn't sort of actually mix. So anyway, we said you can't sort of do that and, 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 and it's going against previous uh, agreements. So we negotiated about this in quite uh, strong terms for over a year. And in the end, we got a promise that they wouldn't build any more private gyms or sort of swimming pools after the ones which were being built, and you see in that photograph. And in return, they said, what do you want? And they gave us a new space to be decided for use by the 
community which is approximately, I suppose, the same size of space as this hall. So, for instance, we, were there, we, we will be put in there a private nursery and sort of so on, things like that. We will put it in, hopefully, a new library, things which help, again, serve the community as a whole. So that is the, is the sort, of, sort of thing we've got, the most sort of latest um, gain we have. We have put forward and asked for a partnership agreement uh, between ourselves, the council, the developers, and Naughty Hill uh, Genesis, which again uh, charts the way forward and again says that from this point onward that it will be a consensus working. Um, that is, we will all have the, that. That is, we will, we will. It is written in that we have to agree on the various stages going, going forward. Um, so I'll just briefly say where we, where we want to go, um, and and I think we have to look at some other questions too. We have to study, which we haven't done enough. The whole question of sort of visa viability, because. Uh, private developers uh, tend to keep viability issues very sort of close to their to their to, to their chest, which makes it very difficult for those of us who are trying to say what we're going to build, how we're going to build it, and so on and so on. Uh, 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 realize what the various sort of options are. We want to increase the number and percentage of, sort of social homes because it's important to sort of realize that while our estate, as I think, has gone quite well, at the same time, in sort of many ways, as far as the, the, the less well-off in London are concerned, we're only standing still as far as our estate is concerned. We're only rehousing the existing tenant. We aren't, we aren't really giving many more homes for the, for the, for the lower sort of income, income people who are on the, there is about 12,000 people on the housing waiting list in Hackney. And, and, and that is something we want to challenge. But we want, want to build a proud community, one that is proud of its history, proud of, proud of the struggles we've sort of fought for, fight on the, uh, fight for the issues which we think the sort of local people sort of want. Um, and, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of close with one, one, sort, of, one sort of small sort of a, a example of the sort of thing which, sort of, which has happened. When the, uh, the developers came, they started putting up all these signs and, and, and placards and uh, uh, billboards with a sign, Woodbury Park, welcome to Woodbury Park. And we went to these meetings and said, Woodbury Park, what's what's this? Never heard of Woodbury Park. You're living in Woodbury Down. And of course they said, ah oh, no, Woodbury Park. And of course they thought Woodbury Park would sell the homes better than a place called Woodbury Down, which you know. <laughs> so they said Woodbury Park. So we would go to these meetings, right? And they would say, Woodbury Park, Woodbury Park, yes. We would, we would get up at these meetings and say, Woodbury Down this, Woodbury Down this. You know? And this went on for about nine months, right? Us speaking on different terminology and calling a place different. And eventually, um, the, uh, the developers came to and said, all right, guys, you've won. We're taking down the signs about Woodbury Park. It's now called Woodbury Down. And we have since then won, I think, four or five prizes, national prizes on Woodbury Down. And they called Woodbury Down a, a community-led regeneration. And we've won prizes for that, you know. So, I mean, that just shows you. I mean, it's not a huge thing. It hasn't changed the conditions. But it sort of shows to me, you know, the sort of, the sort of mindset which I think we have actually changed in uh, the developers and, and the way they've, they've sort of realized that we can speak good uh, sense. I'll end with these sort of slides. On the, on the, 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 the sort of people you'll see there are members of the Sea of the, Re sea of the Reservoirs campaign 35 years ago. You will see the photograph of the reservoir reservoir too. And if it hadn't been for those people, obviously that reservoir wouldn't be there now. Uh, and if that reservoir hadn't been there now, the homes wouldn't have been built. Because Barclay Homes now sell the private homes on the basis of the views of the reservoirs. So if those people hadn't fought for that struggle, those local people hadn't fought for that reservoir, not only would that reservoir wouldn't be there, but the regeneration wouldn't, wouldn't be happening now. So the message I was and the message which I would end with is that, you see, local people know best. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Jeff, especially Jeff left a two week old grandchild um, back in, in London so that he could come be with us today. So we really appreciate you coming here. Thank you so much. So finally, we're honored to have um, Jenny Osborne here from TPASS. Um, Jenny Osborne is a member of the British Order. She was basically knighted for her role in tenant engagement. Jenny runs one of the leading tenant engagement organizations in the UK, and she's an expert in the best ways to involve tenants in many areas of public policy, but certainly in making sure their housing works for them, especially when a lot of change is involved. So thank you, Jenny. Come on up. Well, I'm speaker number six of this morning, so I'm hoping you're going to bear with me, and I'm going to keep you engaged. I will, I will speed up a little bit than I plan to do, just because I know we want to get to questions and answers. So, but thank you, thank you for that. Um, okay, um, uh, my name is Jenny Osborne. I run an organisation called TPAS. And who are we? Um, well, we are a tenant engagement organisation. We work across the whole of England, and we work with um, social housing landlords, so local authority councils or housing associations, um, and with tenants groups. And we cover in that membership organisation about 2.2 million homes across the whole of England, which isn't all of the homes, but it's a significant amount of them. Um, and what are we trying to do? Why do I get out of bed in the morning to run an organisation called TPAS? Well, what we're trying to do is make sure that tenants and communities across England are having the opportunity to have conversations that have real that, ma that matter but have real power to influence decisions, whether that be at a, a local level, whether that be at a regional level, or whether that be at government level and policy making level. It's having conversations that mean something and bringing people together to do that. So talking about bringing tenants and landlords together, it's about an equal partnership. I'm probably going to say that a few times through this presentation, so apologies for that if I repeat it, but I think it's important. That's the premise that we work from, equal partnerships, um, with people getting equal things out of that partnership. And why do we do that? Why do I think tenants and landlords and contractors and builders and developers, why do I think all of those should do um, working together. Well, I think that the facts prove it, that if you bring people together, together you find the solutions you're looking for, um, and often that's about improving services. So particularly now, day-to-day -day engagement, we are working with tenants to help their landlord find ways to improve the services, to do things quicker, to do things cheaper, to do things better for the communities. Tenant engagement delivers that. We're absolutely, I think, tenant engagement should be about saving money, providing efficiencies, describe it whichever way you want to, but let's not be ashamed about we need to save money and tenant engagement can help do that in organisations. But I think, and I'm sure all of us in this room are the same, what we always want to do is bring that lasting change in communities. We're not looking for quick fixes here. There are no quick fixes in housing. I think we all know that. So we're looking for that lasting change in communities. So I'm going to just talk very briefly, because um, we've heard some specific examples, I'm just going to talk kind of quite generally now about what I would call the case for engagement. Why would you do engagement? Why would you do engagement of tenants and landlord? What's the purpose? What do you gain out of it? Well, I always talk very simply about three reasons why you would do engagement. And depending on where we are politically in England, in the cycle that goes on politically and financially and all of these things, some of these things rise to the top more than others, but they're all reasons why you would do it, and they are actually all equal reasons why you would do it. I'll focus on the more boring one first. Let's get that out of the way. Government, regulation, we kind of get told to do it in England. We have to do um, tenant engagement. Sarah talked before about the Decent Homes programme, and one part of the Decent Homes programme that Sarah really um, focused on, what it was about making sure you had to involve tenants. If you wanted the money from government to be able to release um, the stock, to be able to build, to be able to do what you wanted to do, then you had to prove that you'd engage tenants. And that's really, really helpful if government are taking a strong lead on that and saying this has to happen. We've then sort of dipped and moved a little bit with engagement over the last few years. But I think, what, again, what we've seen in England now, since the Grenfell tragedy in London two years ago, we're seeing tenant engagement and the regulatory need to have tenant engagement built into social housing 
is going right back up the agenda and we're seeing more regulation about tenant engagement. You have to do it if you want to be a provider of social housing. Some do it better than others, but you have to do something. Secondly, why, why would you do it? Well, there's an absolutely overwhelming social, personal reason why you would do engagement. Loads of examples, loads of facts that tell you getting tenants and communities engaged with their landlord brings benefit to them in terms of the skills, in terms of confidence, in terms of their connection into their community as volunteers, in terms of their connections with local stakeholders, all the things that can come from that. But it's not just tenants, it's staff as well. They benefit from good engagement. It's no surprise that I go across England, going into various organisations, and the organisations I work, walk into where staff are looking vibrant, empowered, they want to do things, they're really proactive, are the organisations where there is good tenant engagement because it's partnership working. So loads of social reasons why you would do it. And the third reason, which is the one we've really focused on over the last five years in England, is the business case for doing engagement. The business case is proven. We've had loads of research on this. Involving tenants makes good business sense. It translates into pounds saved dollars saved in your case. Um, there's loads of examples of doing that. Why would you not involve the people that are going to be using, are going to be living in your product, in your units? Why would you not involve them? Why would you not use their intelligence, their free consultancy, as Jeff talks about, to give you the solutions that you're looking for? Contractors and housing providers across England have fully understood the business case for involving tenants and the difference it makes to their business. That's why we do engagement in England. But you might be guilty of this because we've all been guilty of it in England as well. Do we often just go and engage when we actually want something? So we all might sit here going, oh, yeah, it's great engaging. It's a good idea, this. But let's only do it really when we want something from somebody. And that is not what we are looking for. And that's not what constitutes good engagement. I am going to race through these a little bit because I'm conscious of time. What we say is tenant engagement is not something that you just do. You just pick up whenever you feel like it. Tenant engagement is the way you run a business as a housing provider. Tenant engagement is something that is embedded throughout the way you run your organisation. It's not a thing. It's the way of being. And we've got six principles, if you like, that we think engagement is placed upon. So I'll race through these a little bit, but there's loads of more information on our website if you want to look at it. So the first one is, if you're going to do engagement, <clears throat> make sure it's linked to your engagement strategy, it's linked, linked, uh, linked to your business plan. I've been in too many organisations where the business plan for the next 10, 15 years for that housing association is written, and it hasn't mentioned residents once in that business plan, and they're the people that live in the homes. Bit of an omission, I would say, in most organisations. The best business plans that I see are often the ones where the, the board, the management board, where the chief exec, people like Kate, where the residents that live in the homes have all gone away for two or three days to somewhere and have worked together to think about what the business strategy is going to be for the next 10 to 15 years. Let the people who are going to be living in your assets help you decide what the strategy should be. Otherwise, you know what? It won't happen. You won't get engagement. It'll just get forgotten about because it's not in the big, shiny business strategy that everybody looks at. You've got to embed it in there from the first place. Secondly, you've got to put some resources into it. Now, in the scheme of things, resident involvement doesn't cost a lot of money. It really doesn't. But I'm not going to pretend you can do it for free. Sorry, people. It doesn't work like that. You've got to put some money into resident engagement. You've got to help make sure the staff to support tenants. You've got to make sure there's access for training for tenants, to resources to go to other events like this. All of this sort of thing needs some money to make it work. I think the other thing that we do in England we've not always got right is if we're going to do engagement, you've got to make sure it's a two-way um, communication of information. So landlords can provide information to tenants, but equally tenants can provide information back to landlords and insight. But making sure you provide information in a way that people want to see, read, will understand. That's really, really important. And in England, what we've been doing over the last few years is really even um, elevating the role of tenants even more in housing associations and making sure that they've got a real role in scrutinising 
the services that a landlord's providing. So typically, a group of tenants will take a service that a landlord provides. I don't know, let's take um, its, its policy on antisocial behaviour in an area. They will look at that, the tenants group, and they'll say, you know what, we think you could do better on this, this and this. Here are some recommendations about how you could do that better. Really letting the tenants take power and control and give solutions to the staff to do things better. That's really, really important. I think another principle is community engagement, and I think you do a lot of that really well here. You know, there's lots for me to learn here while I've been around. But making sure that you're doing more than just engaging tenants in the organisation, it's what we do in the wider community as well. We don't just manage homes, do we? We manage areas, we manage public buildings, we manage lots of things as well. And finally, I'd say, in terms of these, is really value it. When you get it right, when you do it well, communicate it, celebrate it, be proud of that tenant engagement, don't hide it. Tell other people about what you've done. Tell your local politicians about how you, as an affordable housing provider, as a city council, whoever, when you've done great engagement with tenants, let's talk about it and let's tell people what people can do in the future as well. Very briefly, one of the things that Stock Transfer did back in 2010, what Sarah talked about before, Decent Homes, is we created a lot more housing associations. So many of them from that now, um, we have what's called kind of menus of involvement, all the different ways that tenants can be involved in an organisation. These are just a few examples. Um, most housing associations in this country will have some kind of variation on this. So what might we have at the top? Well, in terms of kind of the big power, if you like, and I really am clear about using the word power, tenants having power in an organisation, they'll be on the board, so they'll be making those big, big multi-million pound decisions along with other people, along with accountants and financiers and everybody else. They'll be part of that. They'll be the scrutineers I just talked about with real power to say to people like Kate, Kate, we need to change services. This isn't right. So that kind of power is built in. We've got things like procurement panels. So my team spend a lot of time training, um, training tenants, for example, so that they can sit on the panels that will appoint repairs contractors, that will ask the questions to contractors directly, along with the head of asset management, whoever, and say, you know, when you come in our homes and you're going to do some repairs, how respectful are you going to be when you come in my home? How are you going to treat me? How quickly do you do the work? And they will ask questions as part of that deal as well. That's real power as well. We need to train people to be able to do that, but it's important. We have things like performance groups. So again, tenants will look at how well have we done on collecting rent in the last three months? And tenants will look at that performance, they'll see how people are doing, all part of this mix of working together. And then some of the kind of more, if you like, easier ways of being involved would be lots of these kind of things. Mystery shopping, where tenants ring up the housing association in secret and, and test service. How good? When did the phone get answered? Was the person that answered the phone polite? Did they help me with my query they had? Did they get back to me when they said they were going to get back to me? And we report that back to the staff so they can improve things. All of these things, and there's many, many more besides. Lots of examples of this. The other side of what TPAS do and part of our work <laughs> is in regeneration, the stuff that Jeff in particular has just been talking about. And we have a real specific role in that, um, that is more than just um, training tenants. We have a real belief that if um, tenants should be and have a right to be engaged in any redevelopment of their homes, they have a right to be heard. And crucially, they have an equal part in the solutions and the agreements. And I talk about compromises there, and I think Kate picked up on this. The reality is we're all going to have to compromise if we're coming together in a partnership. Everybody can't um, give up. Everyone can't be expected to win everything. But actually, what Kate was alluding to was a win-win-win if we all agree to compromise and tenants to be an equal part of any discussion. So we place tenants very much in that equal partnership between developer and housing association. But the only way you can do that, if it's going to be genuine, if you're going to do it really and mean it, if you're going to take tenants with you as equal partners, you have to be willing to develop really meaningful options for them to think about, not tokenistic options, not options that aren't really the truth. It's got to be meaningful. 
And base that on what the community's telling you, just like Jeff talked about. If you base it on the community wants and needs, um, you're going to make sure you bring tenants with you and with real commitment to what you're trying to do. We offer something called, and this isn't a plug, by the way, I'm just trying to explain kind of what we do. We offer a service called Independent Tenant Advisors, and I think it's really crucial in any redevelopment uh, work that might be going on in terms of thinking about what might happen. We act as a kind of a little bit, you might describe as a middleman between the housing association, the developer, and the tenants group to make sure the tenants group are absolutely getting access to the right information that tenants are getting the financial information that's on the table. They are seeing the viability statements. They are seeing what the impact's going to be on the environment. They are understanding how much money is on the table and what they can and can't ask for. An equal partner at the table is really important. So we do that role. And that role involves making sure that you give tenants, in particular, we found training to make sure they understand the housing picture that we're operating in. Otherwise, you're expecting people to make decisions with half the information missing, and that's worse than consul not consulting people at all, in my opinion. And very quickly, just finally, we talked about decent homes and the big push that happened, but we're still ongoing. Many of our properties in England are still not decent. Um, as Sarah talked about, one such area we're currently working in is a place called Serpentine Court. This is in Milton Keynes. This is an area where... These houses, people are living in these, they're infested with pigeons. Um, if you walk up the stairwells, um, one of the tenants we were working with uh, a few months ago walked up the stairwell and a huge lump of concrete dropped into her child's buggy. Um, these are dreadful, dreadful conditions. It's part of a, a huge project in Milton Keynes. There's various kind of estates and Serpentine Court is actually a really small part of it. They've kind of separated themselves off because it's so bad at the housing that they've got there. But it's part of a, a, a billion pound upgrade that the council is looking to take um, to, to um, put in place. And we've been working with those tenants, a very really small group of tenants, a steering group, to say, well, what are your options? What's, what's on the table here, really, for your future? And there was three options on the table. Um, one of that was no regen at all. So let's just do nothing. So let's not go any further on this. We'll just stay as we are. But even to stay as you are, the council worked out that would cost them 5.8 million just in the very basic repairs, and even they aren't really happening. The second option was partial regeneration, so trying to get in there and do the best we can with new kitchens, new windows, etc. That would have still cost 73.2 million. Tenants knew this, they saw all of these figures. And the third option was um, demolish all of the 199 properties that are on that estate, but replace it with 400 new ones of which those tenants would have the right to go back in. And that was a cost of 75.3 million. We had an 85% turnout on that ballot of tenants on that estate. So it's only a small one, I appreciate that. And 93% of the tenants that estate voted for option number three, full demolition and new homes to be built. I think the key thing for me here is it's led by a very, very small group of tenants, very young tenants, who took a decision that, you know what, we've got to think long-term future here. These homes are not going to get any better anytime soon, and I want my children to grow up on this estate, and how can I do that? And they, but they took the decision. We influenced them in no way. We just gave them the options for them to have a look at. So I want to end on them, because you've heard a lot from all of us up here. So indulge me for a couple of minutes. It is a bit of a TPAS promotional video. I do, I'm not trying to sell anything to you, um, but I genuinely I'm not. So it's a bit TPAS-tastic. But if you can ignore that, um, I hope what it'll just give you is the voices of tenants from Milton Keynes, the young tenants, some of them in particular. But also we'll just show you a little bit of another estate in England to complement what Jeff's been saying as well. Thank you. We chose TPAS to be our ITA due to having so much to offer us and support us through the regeneration. I voted for TPAS because 
one of the two pads lived on the lakes estate and then so they knew what this estate is like and that's the reason why I went for them and they answered the questions that I asked and showed real interest because the others didn't and they're very helpful. Kevin's been really helpful with the waste management um, because we have really bad waste on Serpentine. Um, we're currently going through a lot of um, training with that, trying to get that sorted out and it's coming along really well. Um, I'm currently vice chair on the steering group and um, Emma's been training us and bringing bits of information over that we need and getting us on the right track that we need to be on. They've been showing us what the plans are and teaching us what to do and they're very helpful. Being there to support us, help us through this whole regeneration, we're doing a course which they're helping us be better chairs and deputies. I hope that everyone gets a fair point, gets a fair say and is the outcome will be really good for everybody. Great. Um, let's get one more round of applause for our new friends from London, please. Um, and I also really want to thank the CHPC staff, um, especially Sarah Watson, who was the brainchild behind this entire project, and Heather Beck, who has been living and breathing this for a very, very long time. Thank you so much. Um, so seeing these presentations with my New York City eyes, um, and you may share this, the, these ideas seem kind of wildly ambitious and frankly crazy in some ways, um, but I think it's important to remember that it was wildly ambitious and crazy in London also, and they've spent the last generation working towards these goals, and these values, um, and they really have something to show for it now. So um, they've achieved so much, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. So I want to thank our um, friends from London, and we have a couple questions from the audience that we want to start with. So first, uh, a little bit of just details on the bricks and mortar. So for the projects that were um, involved full demolition and regeneration, were was the new building built first and then the tenants could move before the demolition began or did everybody have to move off site uh, during the demolition for a period of time before moving back? Um, well, as, as, as far as we are concerned, as I say, this is a 20 year project. So you had to clear this space before you could build it. It was basically built in the same space. So for instance, I was um, one of the first people to have my home knocked down. So I had to move in another uh, old home on the estate um, until the, the new homes were actually built. So um, what actually happened was in the, the early phase is people were what you call decanted twice. So you moved homes before you moved into your new home to allow the old homes to be built. But in the sort of later phases, um, as the ground becomes clear, as each block of flats gets sort of knocked down, and it's a sort of a simple move of people from uh, one block of flats, an old block of flats, into a new block of flats. So um, if you sort of think about it, it sort of makes sense because the first people whose homes are sort of knocked down, there's nowhere to move to. So you have to build in quite quickly to sort of make sure that happens. So you have to wait two or three years. So we, had, we actually waited about three years until our sort of new homes were available. But the later phases, they move in as sort of soon as their homes are knocked down, essentially. Thanks. Um, so this type of project is expensive, obviously. Was there a government subsidy for the construction of the new public housing, or was it all just cross-subsidized from the new market rate units that were coming onto the site? Um, the, the, the way it was sort of financed, there was, no, there was no government subsidy, because the way it was, I mean, it, 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 the way we were financed was that the land that was given over, the council gave the land free, to the property developer. That was the first deal. The property developer then negotiated with the council and the 
agreement was that the profits from the private homes would help finance and help build the homes, the, the new social homes and new shared ownership homes. So it was basically finance from, 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 from the profit of the private developer. But I mean, there are different forms of agreements which are made, I'm sure, I mean, maybe sort of Kate have sort of different sides, but that's the way ours was done. Because at that point of time, the councils weren't, um, didn't have any money to, um, this was 10, 15 years ago when it was first moted, the councils didn't have any money to, to uh, put into homes, really, and the, and, the, and the sort of government had stopped providing any significant funding for it, but that sort of changed since then. Um, what Jeff hasn't mentioned is that the new homes that have been built that we are managing, we have had to pay for those. But we don't pay the full market price. We get it at a discount reflecting the uh, free land in there from the council. I think there are, it's difficult to answer these questions because there are different models every time. And really, they're quite sensitive to the financial appraisal. The length of time that a number of these schemes take the appraisal alters during the course of it. They become more or less profitable. And our Aylesbury estate that was at one stage breaking even is now deeply in difficulty. But we do believe it'll come out as, you know, we've got 20 years for the uh, British economy to improve, so we'll probably be all right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so moving from the capital side to the operations, um, what's the landscape of rental subsidies in the UK? Are the subsidies, are the, the tenants presumably can't pay sufficient rent to operate the property? Is that also just cross-subsidized or is there a rental subsidy component? Uh, basically, the rents that are set are not in relation to people's individual salaries. There is a, a government-determined rent level, really, for social housing. It does vary a little bit between towns, but in London it's less, much less than the market, whereas in some parts of the UK it's quite similar to the market. And uh, that is the tenant will pay that, assuming their job is sufficient or their pension or whatever. But if they're not able to pay that, they can get help with their rent from the government. Uh, it, there is a limit on what, what sort of help the government will give, but virtually all social housing is below that limit. Okay. Um, so in terms of, you talked a lot about how the tenants on the development itself have a say and have involvement and have power. How do you balance that with the wider neighborhood or the wider community, which may have different interests? Is there another way in which those folks get involved and what's the balance of power there between the bigger community or region? Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to take the wider community, and I think that, that's the success of any of the projects that we've been involved in. You, you have the, the steering group of tenants, but you do include the people there that are running the local playgroup, that have got some of the local shops, um, the local bar owner that's got a kind of an interest in this, or, and the local schools are all, you know, what we call key stakeholders in the whole thing. But, you know, this, this is a, an issue that is strongly felt on estates. Who has that final decision about what is going to happen to their homes? And we can get into lots of debates around this. What we have on estates is tenants, so social housing tenants in what we call secure tenancies. And then because of particularly right to buy, on many estates now we have people that own their own homes, we have leaseholders, um, who have a different perspective. And that does, I'm not going to lie to you, make for some very, very, very tricky decisions. People have bought their homes expecting to stay there for the rest of their lives maybe. They've made improvements to those homes. They want to live there. And then suddenly we have um, a housing association or a council coming along saying, we need to do something with this area. It, it's just, I can't give you any easy answer other than it is about being very, very transparent and honest about the situation. Eventually, you edge to the right decision. My, my sounds trite, but my experience is everybody edges to the right decision in the end, given time, given the right information. And I often say to, to, to people when I'm working with them, what's your alternative? Certain projects, if you say no, if it's just a blanket no to this, without looking at the facts and figures, without thinking about where your kids are gonna live in 20 years time, what is the alternative? But it's about, 
It really is about having the time and the space to have those conversations with people. Yes, it's tenants, in majority, it's the leaseholders and the tenants will vote in the end. Not a massive fan of just votes in many ways, um, but it is tricky. And social media in England in particular has made that even trickier. Um, people talking on social media where the debate can kind of spin off in all directions makes that hard. But my advice is you have to involve the wider community, otherwise you're going to hide into nothing. Thanks. Um, so um, I think this is in your glossary, but the American equivalent to the term regeneration is our RAD program, our rental assistance demonstration program. So right away you can see the sort of mismatch in the kind of uh, power of that phrase, right? Regeneration feels like something you want in a way that a rental assistance demonstration possibly less so. Uh, but many NYCHA res residents are concerned that there's not going to be adequate oversight of the private management companies and the developers who come in um, one, and that the rights of tenants are not going to be overseen as well after these RAD conversions. So can you talk a little bit about what the role, the ongoing role of the local housing authority is in providing oversight to somebody like Notting Hill Genesis? Mm -hmm. So we are regulated by a government agency um, that makes sure that we do comply with a lot of regulations and one of them is about tenant rights, tenant involvement, accountability to stakeholders, reputation management. I mean, anything you can think of that we should be doing, it's, we're told to do it. We don't have <laughs> a lot of freedom. Um, they do expect us to demonstrate t uh, active tenant involvement uh, in our organization, in our constitution, Articles of Association, we reserve two seats on our main board for tenants. That's two out of ten. So every single decision at the top level, the most uh, uh, confidential, the most difficult, tenants are there supervising it. And then they're involved all the way through. So we don't expect ever to pull the wool over tenants' eyes. You know, we just accept that the tenants are the people who we do the job for. Some people use the word customer. I don't really like that word. I don't think it's accurate. But they are the consumer of the product. So if they're not happy with it, it's not going to work. So uh, that, that's the basic principle. We, we are answerable and accountable to the people who we house. Uh, and that's sort of built in now to our culture. It's not always perfect. And it really is important that we don't pr produce a sort of idea here that this is nirvana. It isn't. It's really hard. But it's harder not to do it. That's my lesson. It's harder not to do it. If you don't do it, it doesn't work. It's like staff consultation. It's even like involving your family in a decision on a holiday destination. You know, if you say, oh, I booked so-and-so and they haven't had a say, it's probably not as good as if you asked their opinion. Can I just... just step into that as well. It, certainly the stock transfer in the, in the big programs that Sarah was talking about earlier, what many of the, the organisations did, they set up with tenants, they agreed together, a series of promises, so stock transfer promises. So in the next 10 years, for example, what are we going to deliver on? And that, a lot of that would have been about improving the condition of the homes. It was about releasing money to put new bathrooms in, uh, you know, new, new kitchens, whatever it might be. So, you know, typically many organisations would end up with promises that are then monitored over the next 10 years, not only by the tenants, might have been the original tenants who were part of the steering group, but the local council. Um, local MPs, our local members of parliament, would be looking at that, you know, be very honest and open. What have we said we're going to do? a part of this deal, what have we all committed to, let's publish it, let's talk about it, and over the next 10 years, let's see how we're making progress. Now, what happened for many organisations, they hit those 10 promises, or however many there were, quite early on in the programme, you know, by year seven, eight, nine, they were hitting those. And then what you have to do, you have to revolve, then you're a new, org you're a different organisation by then, 10 years on, you're not publicly owned in the sense of the council owning you, you are now with a not-for-profit organisation. You set new promises and you set a new promise that tenants will monitor with you. So I think being very open with what you say you're going to deliver as part of getting this money and having tenants in particular monitoring whether that happens is key. Yeah, and I would add that in the at least the transfer I was working on, there's many different structures, but the tenants are voting on a full promise called an offer document that they have to that is binding, and that includes a copy of the lease that they're signing for a permanent lease. Um, so they can go through and with an independent tenant advisor have lawyers and see that lease. Um, and often it was like the first time that tenants were seeing a lease, so actually it was like even more comforting. Like they 
had not really understood the provisions of their own lease before under the council. So um, they were, it was actually added transparency. They were, they were voting on all the changes, but they were also had, a le had, some legal, had legal advice and seeing the legal lease in front of them that they were signing long term. Great. Um, and so I don't know if, I don't think Sam Marks from LISC is here, but he starts all of his panels with a question that I really like, which is around kind of checking your bias and divulging what it is, where you come from in this. And I think this is such a core question around concern about the oversight. Um, and I have to say from CHPC's perspective and from my perspective, it's always been a bit of a head scratcher. Who's the, the oversight for NYCHA residents today is HUD. So there's someone in here who knows how many employees HUD has nationwide or how many they have in New York City, um, but it's clearly the resources and the oversight. I think we can all agree that that's been insufficient. Um, whereas we have a generation of experience in the affordable housing sector, again, this is my bias, this is where I come from, um, where there's an entire network of oversight mechanisms, where there's a variety of different stakeholders, all of which, frankly, would hit their bottom line if these fundamental standards weren't met. So it comes to funding, it comes to appropriation, and then it all also comes to compliance in the actual building itself. So NYCHA, um, you know, funding for public housing has been cut and cut and cut over the last 25 years. There's not been particularly an effective, clearly there's not been an effective outcry against that because it continues to happen. There's one little, meanwhile, compare that, there's one little minor tweak to the 4% tax credit program and every bank in town is in DC in full force, making sure that that does not happen. So there's just a much broader and much, you know, more powerful, frankly, constituency in the affordable housing world, both for making sure the resources remain in place. And then on any individual project, there's five or six different stakeholders, all of whom are charged legally with looking over each other's shoulders, and all of whom would get in a lot of trouble and a lot of financial penalty if they didn't do so. And that's been a successful, for the most part, um, oversight structure in the affordable housing world that's been missing and that we think is part of the problem with the current, the, why we find ourselves in this current state for NYCHA public housing. Um, Eight thousand four hundred and sixteen, and that's nationwide or in New York. And there's by some accounts ten times that in NYCHA residents. Um, so it's clearly that's not going to, um, you know, that that's what we're relying on in the current public housing structure. So some of the rad deals will have a much more robust and tested network of oversight. That's CHPC's perspective and my own. Um, so there's these offer documents or these MOUs between the tenants and the developers. So what's the legal framework that ensures that those documents are legally binding? What happens if somebody breaks a promise? What, what is the mechanism that exists in the UK for that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, as I say, we went through various, we've gone through various uh, uh, documents we've, we've signed. The first one, which I've talked about, was a memorandum of agreement. Um, Legally, I am told that has no basis whatsoever, right? Um, <laughs> however, right? However, it, 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 would, it, it would cause the developer huge reputational damage if it came up and they'd made certain promises which, 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 which they didn't keep. And it doesn't make good economic sense from their point of view to break those promises. Because if they build to regenerate in sort of some other areas or develop in some other sort of council areas, the word will go round that these people can't be trusted, right? So I mean, so that the uh, document we signed recently about about nine months ago, um, the partnership agreement between everybody involved, the council, not in Hill Genesis. Uh, uh, and ourselves and the developers um, that did have legal force. Now, I sort of know that because it took because uh, the sort of council kept coming back to us says our lawyers are looking at this, you know, and the thing was delayed for a long time because people's lawyers were actually looking at it. So I assume it's got legal force, or they wouldn't spend all this money uh, paying sort of lawyers to sort of do that. So I mean that has sort of legal force some somehow there, but. To, to sort of tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I think it's this, it, it is this question, right? Of, I mean, the, 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 this question of reputational sort of damage, which I think especially sort of developer, de, de, 
developers in places like London are very scared about because they do not want to get a bad reputation. Otherwise, when they come to bid to the other uh, uh, regeneration things, then they won't get that, that bid through. Thanks. Um, so, Kate, Notting Hill Genesis is a very large, profitable nonprofit housing provider. Um, you have more units than, you have the same number of units as the entire plan for RAD over the next 10 or 15 years in New York City are currently owned by Notting Hill. Um, but there are also some for profit developers who are involved in regeneration, and certainly that's part of the plan here. What do you see, how do you see the differences between those two different types of firms, and is there a role for both in this environment? Yeah, I think the housing issues are so enormous, we need all hands to the pump. I mean, I would not speak against the private sector developers. We work alongside them. We use their skills. Sometimes we're in partnerships and joint ventures with them. But I'm really proud of what we do as social enterprises because we are businesses that do make a profit. Uh, last year, we made 106 million in really difficult circumstances. Every penny of that is recycled into the provision of more social housing. And it's enabled the taxpayer to give us less and less as we become more and more profitable. So, it, you know, we had a little joke. We're like Robin Hood. We take from the rich, the people who buy our homes for a million pounds and the people who rent the market housing, and we put that in to help the poor to make sure that our rents are affordable for people on lower incomes. And it's as simple as that. As a social enterprise, we run as a business. We're very effective. Our profit levels are better than many of the private sector. Our staff are very, very good and regarded as some of the best in the sector as developers. We just pay them the mid midpoint position. We don't give big bonuses or anything like that. They're there because they believe in what we do. They're passionate about what we do. We get a lot more out of them as a result. And uh, I think all of us can go to bed at night feeling we're not enriching shareholders, but enriching communities and people's lives. That makes it a more fun thing to do, but I also love making money. You know, I have to admit it. I really enjoy making money because it gives us power, and it gives power to the people who don't have it, and it gives resources to people who don't have them, and that makes me feel good. Okay. Um, so one of the major factors in discounting the views and of public housing residents in the U.S. is racism. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how that plays out in the U.K.? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I would say, I mean, I, it, it, it's very easy for, for me to sort of sit here and say, really, um, racism hasn't been a major issue in Woodbury Down. I mean, I can say that as a sort of white sort of male and so on and so on. So, I mean, you know, take, take everything what I say with a sort of pinch of salt, to be, quite, to be quite frank about this. But it sort of so happens that, for instance, when... In the, 18, in, in, the, in the sort of 19th sort of 80s, when there was a lot of racism in London um, and a lot of uh, uh, discrimination in London and um, lots of bad things were sort of happening, that sort of thing didn't happen in Woodbury Down. And, and, and uh, again, I think, which is why I refer to the sort of history of it, if you look at the people who came to Woodbury Down after the Second World War, um, then there were a lot of, for instance, of, 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 of Jewish people, there were lots of Irish people. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years, there's a lot of Turkish people come and a lot of Kurdish people come. And there's been no real sort of problems with this, right? Um, obviously, communities live their own lives, like Irish people go to Irish pubs and Turkish people go to, you know, Turkish clubs and so on. I mean, all that sort of happens. Um, but, but, but sort of at the same time, I don't think that that's, there has been any racism as far as, as, far as I can see in, in, in a major scale. Now, that hasn't happened, to be quite frank about it, in sort of other areas. And if you look somewhere, like sort of Grenville, the vast majority of people there were were of non-white, uh, non-white ethnic sort of origin, right? And because that was viewed as a sort of dump area, almost a dump tar, which 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 was in very bad condition, and so on and so on. So these things happen. I mean, I'm not saying they don't happen; they obviously do. Um, but I think um, I don't think as far as our sort of local area. I mean, I thought in the sort of 
Yeah, I'll just end with this. I thought in the sort of 1980s when there was a lot of racism going on, things were going to get very, very bad. And we did have racist organisations, leafleting sort of our estate and so on and so on, but they never got any traction and they never got any real significant support, which is something, you know, I think we're, we're all quite sort of proud of, really. Can I just add a little, a little bit to this? Um, my organisation, more than half the people we house are black and more than half of the staff we have are black. There are more black people in social housing than white people, but it is highly integrated in a way that we haven't so far seen in the US where there's a lot of segregation. Uh, we have white working class people uh, living on our estates uh, side by side with black people. It isn't only used for black people, it is there for all. And there are a lot of policies to try to make sure that the housing is allocated fairly. Obviously, it isn't entirely, you know, there is uh, all sorts of pre-existing situations that give black people a worse a situation. But I don't think it's as extreme in the UK as it perhaps has been here, which is, the history is very, very different. So um, it is a, it's a live issue, it's something we're terribly interested in, the issue of diversity, inclusion. Um, is very high on the agenda of all, all um, public bodies and many private bodies as well. It's something that we continually have to address and do what we can to uh, ensure that voice of black people is equal to the voice of white people in the same way that the voice of tenants is equal to the voice of the developers and other um, stakeholders. And we have to work against all the biases and all the um, precon preconceptions and discrimination and oppression that is there, and it has to be a continual fight against it. But uh, I think we're conscious and aware of it. But um, it, 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 one important aspect of our housing estates, I think, is that they are very, very diverse. And in many places, there are dozens of languages, dozens of celebrations of different um, religions and different uh, public holidays and so on. So they have a, a very positive aspect of creating diversity in the city. But I mean, London as a whole is a lot like New York in that it is incredibly diverse. And we see this as a, one of the things that makes it a fantastic place to live. I think, just to add very quickly to that, I think, um, yes, we, we do have a problem with racism in, the, in, in England, but I think we, our problem is also around um, the class divide in England. We get much more obsessed around class, and, you know, if you're working class, if you're middle class, if you're upper class, and that's been kind of our history far more in many ways. And what's happened over the last um, so many decades in England... It's been easy to characterise social housing as poor people, as poor working class people, and that's irrespective of colour. That is just your poor. Um, there's a real campaign in England at the moment around stigma, the stigma of living in social housing. 93% of social housing tenants, when the survey was done, felt that they are stigmatised. And, and again, that's across um, all um, ethnic backgrounds. People say that's, it's, it's that that's the issue for us, is... You live in social housing, that means all you are is a drain on the, on the state, you don't put anything in, you don't contribute, you're bad people. And that narrative in England has, has grown up mainly from the media. It's also about the financial situation. It grows up when there aren't enough homes. So what happens is people go get fed up with the people that have got homes. There is jealousy, there's distrust. So I think we've got all that playing out as well in England. And it's, so it's not about just racism. And I, I understand how I said that. Um, what I'm saying is it's, it's a bigger issue for us as well that's around um, about class. Um, so before we wrap up, I just want to hear each of you wrap up for a few seconds about your reflections on some of your visits here and any advice you have for us about how we can take a first step uh, towards a more positive vision for public housing. Um, very briefly from me, I think you've got it all here. I think you've got everything in place that could do that. The people that we have met are showing real willing. I think you've hit the point that we hit in England of doing nothing is not an option. You've got to move some, be brave. Be brave. People are decent people. People will come to the right decisions if you are honest and transparent. Um, and if you're really bold and brave, you can make some real impacts into this. But you've got to do it in an equal partnership. Um, yeah, 
we met some we met people um, yesterday from uh, uh, the uh, housing authority, the New York Housing Authority, and the question was sort of put to us. Um, there's a lot of distrust in uh, New York um, about developers and about housing schemes because people don't trust capitalism, right? And he says, you know, and, and I mean, how do you win this trust trust over? And um, I sort of thought about that, and the answer I gave in that meeting wasn't terribly good, so I've, I've sort of thought about, about the reply to that. And obviously, we, I mean, we all know, we all know, I mean, I, I know that Barclay Homes, who come to the area, their aim is essentially to make profit, right? But the, but, the, but the way I think we answer people's fears is a really, if you like, a traditional answer to that, a traditional working class answer to that, is that the people on the receiving end, the consumers, the people who live in the area, organize themselves, right? And, and, and the strength, and uh, if you like, combating the priority of the interests of the shareholders is for local people to organize themselves, to educate themselves, to agitate themselves, because ultimately those people are actually stronger than the, than the other people of the class divide. That's what I think anyway, and I think that some of the things that we have achieved, because we have organized, we have, because we have negotiated, we haven't screamed and shouted and sloganized, we've negotiated seriously, like a trade union does, for instance, then I think that the strength of, 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 of our scheme is that the, the interests of the sort of local people have been promoted and have been respected by those who, 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 we, who we talk to. I don't have much to add. You've heard from some real experts here today and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. We appreciate the time you've given us and we hope we've offered you something that might be of value. New York and the people in it and the buildings you have and the resources you have are immense. Some of the best in the world in terms of intellect, in terms of energy, in terms of creativity and diversity and motivated people and people with great values you should be able to sort it out. And I'd just say it takes quite a long time. Uh, you know, you have to do this in lifetimes rather than quick fix. And anybody who wants a quick fix is going to be disappointed. But if you keep on, uh, you know, working hard together, it will happen. And I think uh, we'd all like to come back in about 10 years and see how you're getting on. So <laughs> looking and, forward to that. Thank and you. on that note, thank you so much all for coming. <laughs>